So now we, I think we all realize that most things in AML these days are controversial, but I think we can safely say that one thing that is not controversial is the fact that um, MRD positivity is a bad thing and associates with uh, worse prognosis when it's detected post remission. And this is um, data from a meta-analysis of over 80 studies in AML with, I think, over 11,000 patients and a variety of um, MRD detection methods. And the overarching conclusion is that MRD positivity uh, predicts for worse uh, overall survival and disease-free survival. So that's really become a given in our field that MRD testing is clearly important and prognostic. So these are the um, 2020, the ELN 2022 guidelines for MRD monitoring in uh, different AML categories based primarily on the availability of high sensitivity PCR testing assays uh, for leukemic transcripts. Um, I think we all realize that this will likely be a dynamic field and changing as the technology improves and we can create higher sensitivity assays for uh, molecular testing at the uh, genetic level. But um, generally speaking, MRD positivity at the end of treatment um, and then in, in follow-up up to two years are right now considered uh, key decision time points uh, for therapeutic intervention of some type, although admittedly mostly related to transplant decisions at this point in time, um, clearly we're moving in the direction of using MRD information to guide um, therapeutic decision-making outside of transplant, but that's still in really early phases of discovery. But why don't we start out by asking an important question that pertains to MRD testing, and that is in the, say, non-favorable, primarily the ELN intermediate risk AML setting, um, can or should the MRD assessment at the end of treatment supersede the baseline molecular risk stratification for determining next steps in treatment, for example, LO transplant. So an ELN intermediate risk patient, or maybe even a poor risk patient, but probably more the intermediate risk patients, um, how should we be using MRD assessment at the end of this treatment to make decisions, if, if, if at all? And maybe what I'll do is just, I'll start the discussion by maybe uh, reaching out to, to Roland, if he's still on the, on the line, because he's done some work and investigation in this area, just to kind of get the discussion started. Roland, what are your thoughts about how we can use MRD assessment in the non-favorable risk setting post revision? Yeah, so thanks for letting me start. Uh, I'm sure it's gonna be somewhat controversial. So, I, I mean, I think the old data have sort of suggested that there's on average, probably some small benefit with allografting in first remission in intermediate risk leukemias, right? Um, now, admittedly, the landscape changes, right? We have all like new ways of doing transplants. We have new ways of post remission therapy. Um, so the, the goalposts change, but there probably is a small benefit overall. Now, that would suggest that for the people that do better than the average, maybe the benefit is less or even is non existing. And in light of some data showing even some that delayed use of transplant in these patients is probably not detrimental on average. I think you can make an argument that MRD testing could be useful in that people that get an MRD negative remission, particularly maybe with the first cycle of therapy, maybe their average outcome is that much better than the average outcome for intermediate risk overall, that maybe those could be spared a transplant at least a, a, a transplant in first remission and, and be treated with a sort of a delayed use of transplantation in case of relapse. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's an important point and recognizing that a finite number of patients with intermediate risk disease can be cured or have long-term survival without transplant and that perhaps the overall survival at the end of the day is not different whether right. you you transplant an MRD negative patient in first remission or beyond. So I think that raises, uh, you know, uh, cost of care issues as well that I think payers are going to be looking at down the road as some of this data develop. But yeah. it also and, impacts and, co co and comorbidities with transplant, right? Right. Uh, to exactly. HD long term. 
But I think that what we're what we're shifting to, though, and I've been, I, I think that there are some um, sort of broad uh, philosophical, practical, and clinical issues of, on the one hand, and and I would include the good risk here actually, because I think that it's it's completely unclear whether a an allegedly good risk NPM one mutated patient who's MRD positive at the end of some intensive chemotherapy is good risk anymore, right? So I think your question is actually relevant to all categories of of AML. That if if you've got leftover disease, where are the areas that we would conceptually shift to a transplant de-escalation, and are you trading that? Are we trading? the curative option for the anxiety provoking option of relying on your MRD test to watch a bouncing ball, extend maintenance and tell patients that they're gonna be hanging out on some level of sprinkling of a little laser, maybe a little ven, maybe I throw in a little bit of guilt, maybe I do this, maybe I watch. So I'm 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 pushing back conceptually, not, 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 rendering a clinical pin opinion on a on an individual patient at the moment but getting rid of allotransplant which we can talk about freely cuz Charlie isn't on the line so the formerly what we could do for some patients with this disease is cure them are we actually saying that we're going to de-escalate in order to eliminate the upfront morbidity and mortality of transplant and stop, you know, stop patients going through that? But are we definitely replacing that with something good? Because I'm not hearing anything about, well, it's too much therapy and they don't need as much and all we do is leave them alone. I think we're scared to do that. I don't think any of us is in love with the MRD data enough to stop following these patients very, very closely. And I think we keep sprinkling them then with maintenance treatments that we then don't know how to stop. And MD Anderson has led the way in getting rid of chemotherapy. I mean, fantastic results in pH positive ALL, for example, getting rid of a ton of chemotherapy and yet not actually stopping TKI maintenance, right? We're all scared to do that. Well, maybe two years, maybe three years, but then you start talking to the patients and they're on therapy forever. And that's an and that's a disease where we actually know what we're doing and we have a marker. So in ALL, if we dump transplant, are we saying that everybody's gonna be on medicine and monitoring forever? That's my question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, in terms of kind of finalizing, finishing up on this topic, um, I guess it would be nice to have like some opinion about whether an MRD negative test in a non-favorable risk patient, post remission, post at the end of treatment, plan treatment, is sufficient to justify not taking a patient to transplant. Are we is it, are we at a stage where we can say we're we're okay with that approach saying okay, overall survival may very well probably is the same um if you look at it from the standpoint of when you transplant somebody. Um but as a group are we still in the camp of yes, everybody with non-favorable risk MRD negative status if at all possible should be transplanted or is it reasonable to say that those patients could be watched and monitored at the end of treatment with the knowledge that some of them may have long-term benefit and survival. I guess that's kind of one of the core clinical questions that I'm getting asked a lot from uh, you know, non-academic colleagues that are seeing these patients that, that do have transplant centers attached to them as well. How about in, in Europe? How about uh, Jordi or Jorge? What yeah. is what's happening in Spain? Well, I think that the intermediate group uh, uh, includes now uh, a high proportion of patients who have three three mutations, and uh, we know from uh, ratify and from the trial with quetiapinib that the the sequence uh, of uh, chemo induction consolidation plus three three inhibitor followed by allogeneic transplant. Uh, gives uh, very good results in terms of uh, uh, leukemia-free and overall survival. So in this particular case of intermediate, 
uh, uh, genetics with flip three mutation, I think that I would be very uh, cautious to uh, not to propose allogeneic transplant uh, due to the negativity of uh, of MRD. Uh, the question seen in the other uh, 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 the other patients without flip three mutation belonging to the to the intermediate risk category. Gregory, and this is an open question for sure. And then, uh, Jordi, yes, you could give uh, us the final word on this question. Yes, I am most uh, more in line with with Jordi Sierra. Uh, maybe my concern is the tools that we are using for MRD measurement. So, for patients with MPM one, you can rely uh, on the sensitivity. But for those patients without MPM1, we are you no know, the standard is flow cytometry with a threshold of 0.1%, which probably it's, it's too high and, and some consider negative patients uh, are really have persistent leukemia and to skip transplant in those patients, I think is is risky. So at that moment I think it's mm, uh, it's very risky to to accept that any MRD negative patients can skip uh, a transplant. Obviously, not a lot of uh, uh, consensus in this group, which is totally understandable. And I think we would all agree that we need more data and probably um, randomized trials to answer this question in particular.